Thank you, Sarah, for joining us today. I'm very excited to be having a conversation with you. Um, oh, it's lovely. <laughs> so I thought we could start off with, I mean, I suspect everybody who's done their forest school training will have heard of you. I suspect they have read some of your books because you have several of them about forest school. Yes. Um, I, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I thought, it might be nice for us to hear a little bit about your own journey of what brought you to forest school and you know how how have you ended up where you are now you know a phd in, in PhD. forest school you know <laughs> so yes um, phd is, is is typical of me doing things backwards but that's another story completely that i do it when i retire not when i start in my career but <laughs> but i suppose being um, brought up with grandparents who are very keen on gardening, having the bliss to live in the country and run wild as a child. Um, my second year of teaching I spent in Norway, um, teaching at the British School in Trondheim, uh, where I took my Barnhagen children, who were three to seven, outside every day, even when it was minus 20, in their zip up um, all in ones, and they rolled around in the snow and had a lovely time. And to me, that just seemed like the right and natural way of doing things. Um, when I got back, um, I couldn't get a teaching job to start off with, and I started working in a computer firm, um, but obviously kept going with the, with the natural connection. Um, and eventually, when I got back into teaching, um, I was teaching in a nursery class and realised that they weren't doing as much outdoor learning as I thought was appropriate. So I wrote series of articles for Nursery World. Started writing straight away. Always have done. I've always written. I've always put my thoughts down. That's why I organise my thoughts is putting them down on paper. Other people tell stories, I write. So um, did these are series of articles and I started working part time um, with the Greenlight Trust in Suffolk. They were doing a wonderful programme called Seed to Tree whereby the children in the local schools, which are a, a lower middle upper system, um, planted a natural tree seed that they had collected in from their hedgerow in their first year of school and tended it so that when they left the school, they then planted it out into community woodlands. And we were running this project all over Suffolk. And I was doing the introductory stuff because I, it was the little ones and I was the specialist in the little ones. And then Susanna Podmore, um, who was at that time the coordinator for forest education, the forest education network, um, came and said, look, there's this thing called forest school and it started in Bridgewater in Somerset and, and it's taken off in Worcestershire and, and Oxfordshire and we've got it as far as the midline of England. We can't get it any further. It's stuck. We need somebody who will initiate it in the east. Does anybody want to go? <laughs> so um, I did a visit down to Bridgewater College and that would be the late 1990s. I'm a bit hazy on dates, but yeah. So late 1990s, went down, saw it, thought, yeah, this is, this is what we should be doing. And um, I trained with Gordon Woodall, um, who, who was one of the original people who went to Denmark, but he wasn't an early years teacher. He was a builder. And they'd taken him because they got some male students and they needed a male tutor. But he was able to see the importance of forest school for all age groups. So when he started up his own um, organisation, they, they always included children who were struggling with mainstream education at the end of primary or early secondary stage. So that straight away included those uh, younger, that, oh, those older age groups as well as the youngsters. But I did my training with him and I also trained as a trainer. And so I was um, working by then at an FE college training nursery nurses. I was trying to run my own forest school sessions to get more familiar, more, more experience. I was going out with Gordon on his training sessions at weekends <laughs> and in my spare time. <laughs> I was writing the, the new courses for, to get them validated through OCN so we could run them at the Greenlight Trust. And that's how I got into it. 
wow <laughs> sounds like a busy time <laughs> it was a very busy time and you and I have just discussed the fact that I ran the first taste today in um, for the Greenlight Trust in 2003. This lovely lady called Louise Ambrose came and joined me. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that would have been the first time we would have met as well. I, would I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was my first experience of forest school. So I'm, I'm very grateful for you to have brought it over to the east of England so yes. that I could have uh, experienced it. And we've had some, I mean, we, we, it's really doing well now. I mean, Essex, Suffolk, Cof, uh, Norfolk, Cambridgeshire, all of those counties have got very, very strong forest school groups going, which is lovely. One of the things I love about forest school is it has been a real grassroots movement and how it's organically spread. You know, we, we've never had like a top down thing saying we you know everybody needs to be doing forest school it's it's come from people motivated and passionate like yourselves uh you know wanting to spread it and you know seeing the benefits firsthand for children while i've been doing my phd i found the label for that oh <laughs> forest school is socially constructive it's a social constructionist not constructivist, which is to do with Vygotsky and all of those theorists about early years learning. It's constructionist, which means each of us has brought our own passions, whether that's storytelling, gardening, um, wildlife education, um, canoeing, whatever it is, we have brought it on the, in the assumption, we've always made the assumption that what we know is what we each know, and that is what we think is good. And we've negotiated consciously and unconsciously um, the good bits. And from that has come Forest School and the six principles. It's, it, it's a wonderful system when you really get into it because it, it contains threads of so many disciplines. There's art, there's education, there's psychology, there's health, there's sociology, there's theology, there's biology. It's all in there. And that's what makes it so difficult to research because it is truly interdisciplinary. And most people, when they come, most academics, when they're researching things, are coming from a single discipline. And that doesn't fit forest school. In fact, lots of things don't fit forest school. <laughs> I, and just hearing your passion there for the diversity of everything that's in there, like I, I that's totally how I see it as well. Mm -hmm. And you, you kind of pulling that apart about how it doesn't quite fit all way, all, almost with researching. I guess historically in science, we've had like, um, uh, oh, what do you call it? Like a compartmentalized approach to science where you, or you sort of cut things into smaller and smaller parts yeah. to be able to study the details of them. But with something that holistic. Work. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. This holistic doesn't work. And, and even where you get, um, you get researchers working in pairs or threes and they're working multidisciplinary, they're each bringing their own specialism, but they're not taking due regard of the other bits interdisciplinary means you have due regard of all the bits yeah and that's really difficult to do really hard wow have you in your in your kind of academic uh career have you found ways of doing that or, or have, have you come across I people think who are I'm, doing that in other sectors i've been i've been trying um because most, most of the research gets hung up on the outcomes. How can we show what the benefits are? And that's, that's good. And most of the research that they just does show what the benefits are. But of course, when you start unpicking it, you have to think, well, why? Why are those benefits? Why, why is it working? What is it that makes it work? So, for me, the thing that makes it work is adherence to the six principles. I think that's really, really important. Um, because once you start looking at the six principles, you can see that interdisciplinariness coming through. It's a bit like, um, I think of it in terms of the mitochondrial DNA, um, networks that trees are fed from. 
So underneath the ground, there's all these my mitochondrial strands and they're swimming about and they might be mitochondrial strands, strands from psychology or philosophy or whatever they are. They feed into the tree and all those different things are there, but they're held together by the six principles. So the six principles are like the bark of the tree that's holding it all together, uh, firm and strong. And when you start looking at, um, at, at the, the, the hows and the whys, twice now in my career, I've, I've undertaken a research project that's nearly, 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 nearly got there. And the first time I was working with Essex County Council and I had access, well, they, I didn't actually have access, but they searched it for me because there's, there's child protection issues about these things, uh, about mapping um, schools that were doing forest schools and were, schools that weren't doing forest schools by size, location, number of free school meals and number of SENs um, and seeing what the outcomes were at the end of the foundation stage. Now, I, I actually, that for that project, it was quite a big project, and the, and the vice chancellor gave me money to pay two second year students to crunch the data, because I'm crap at data. <laughs> so they did this for me, and, and they came, they were heartbroken. They came to me, Sarah, and said, oh, there's no statistically significant difference. It's not statistically significant. And I was heartbroken. There was a difference, but it wasn't big enough to be called statistically significant in the benefits, in the, in the outcomes for children who had forest school and those who had not So it's there, but it was a teeny weeny gap. I kick myself now because when I left the university, I ditched that data. Now, 2018, I was working with Cambridgeshire County Council on a voluntary basis, and we did a very similar exercise um, but I did it with a, a guy who was part of the early years team who is a whiz at statistics. And on the back of this, he's now gone off to do his MA. <laughs> but that's another story entirely <laughs> because he got so excited about doing research, he'd never done it before. <laughs> so we looked at the data. And again, the difference between settings that were not doing forest schools and settings that were doing forest schools, the outcomes between the, the children at the end of the EYFS were small. It was there, but it wasn't statistically significant. But in this occasion, we had somebody else working with us who knew the schools and was able to say, actually, if we separate out the schools who are doing forest schools, separate out the ones that are adhering to the six principles, and the ones that aren't, we might get a different answer. So Graham went away and did that. And indeed, if you looked at the schools who were not doing forest school and the schools where they were doing forest school and sticking to the forest school principles, the difference was statistically significant. And it just underlined for me the importance of the six principles. Then COVID hit and we haven't been able to pick it up again. In fact, I'm seeing um, some of the Cambridgeshire mob in, at the beginning of next term, and I'm just hoping to kickstart a follow-up project. It's going to be very, very difficult to do, because how do you say to a setting, I want to measure your outcomes because you're not doing it right? <laughs> wow. And um, just hearing that, that research there, that's really fascinating, because... For, um, from my experience of being a trainer, some, some, sometimes people, they don't, they might have heard forest school and they think they know what it is, but they haven't fully grasped the, the depth of it and, and, and the, the six principles. And um, I've noticed that people do get, I guess, quite sensitive if they think they're doing forest school and then somebody says what, well, actually it's not it's not quite full full fat forest school it's not quite adhering to all those six mm -hmm. principles um but i mean as, the way i i see it is getting children outside in any form is going to have benefits oh gosh yes and, and as research, education is beneficial sure, absolutely and and the I, research that you've been talking about they does show it might not be statistically um 
valid, but there is, you said, a small, a small difference there in terms of benefit, which being outside, you know, if there's free play opportunities, of course, that's all really good and healthy for, for, um, for, for children. But, um, and it depends um, what outcomes you want. Absolutely. If, if yeah. what you want is to educate children factually about environmental education, probably forest school is not the best way to do it. Absolutely. If you yeah. want to engage them emotionally, that's a different matter entirely. Yeah. Um, if you want to build the neural pathways that will make them want to be outside when they're grown ups and having their own children, forest school's a great thing. Um, if you want them to know why, it probably isn't. <laughs> there's, there's all sorts of different ways of looking at it. Absolutely. And I guess as practitioners, it's about knowing what you're aiming for. Yes. To pick the right approach for you and your setting. And don't um, call it forest school if it isn't. Be absolutely. proud about what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I've often thought because my background before I heard about forest school, my background was environmental education and, and outdoor learning. And part of me still feels a little bit what what why is everybody labeling everything for a school when it's clearly environmental education which is great in its own yes. right yeah. or earth education which is great in its own yeah. right or bushcraft that's great in its own right yes. so we should be celebrating all Definitely. of those uh you know approaches of working with people it's a forest forest school is only one tree yeah there are lots of other trees out there they're all fed by some of the same mitochondrial DNA. All those mitochondrial little networks and pathways feed the different trees in different ways. Are you, are you, are you talking about the fungi? Is it fungi? Fungi, yes, you're, you're it's fungi. Right. <laughs> My, mycorrhizal, is it mycorrhizal? Um, yeah, yes, got the wrong word. Mycorrhizal, yes, mycorrhizal fungi, yes, yeah. Although, you know, mitochondrial DNA is pretty cosmic too, isn't it? It's it is, yes. <laughs> Have you read the, the, the Seven Daughters of Eve? No, no, I haven't. Oh, that's wonderful. That's an exploration of the mitochondrial DNA of the species. It's, uh, yes. Mm. Yeah, you're right. Mycorrhizal. Mm. The mother tree. <laughs> mm. Yeah. But that's a fantastic metaphor as well, isn't it? Because as I understand it, with the, with the fungi and the trees, mm. like the trees wouldn't exist. If, if it wasn't for those kind of relationships you know and and yeah. the and the exchange of minerals for sugars and, and things you know that amazing it's amazing. like we we can't we can't exist in isolation no uh, and if we want a forest you know different species of trees need different things they all have a purpose they all have a place and i think that is so important the, the forest school tree is just one tree in the forest. Value it, look after it, nurture it, don't sit on it, don't squash it, don't cut bits off it. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it, perhaps it has another tree that's much more suited to what you want to do. Be brave, go for it. Don't try and make a birch into an oak. You no, know. <laughs> quite. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, go taking that metaphor further, like there is the pro natural process of succession as well, isn't there? Yes. And how, again, in, um, I guess in, what would we, we call ourselves, like uh, the, the educational or, sort of, as you said, it's lots of things, educational health, psychology movements, if you like, there's, there is patterns of change, isn't there? There's there's mm. pioneering species that might come and set the ground, like often in forest school, uh, certainly in the training aspects, we encourage people to look at different learning theorists and yeah. you know, people like Froebel, for example, comes to mind, you know, a couple yeah. of hundred years ago with his kindergartens. And, you know, only now are we starting maybe to see the, the, the growth from the seeds he might have set 200 years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, so it takes time to grow a forest as well, doesn't it? And it takes it does. time for balance to occur. Yeah. And it takes time to grow a forest, but every year we get new leaves. And forest school itself as a movement is constantly moving, constantly changing. There's new branches, there's new leaves, there's, there's new flowers, whatever, 
it, it, I, I find that wonderful. I, I, I find it, I go to training sessions because I still have a hand in with the Green Light Trust and I, I, I help them variously occasionally. And I go in and sit on one of Mel's sessions just on the outskirts of it. And I just love listening to those ideas flying around and thinking, yeah, where, where are you going to take us? You know, you're only 20, I'm nearly 70. Where are you going to take this? You know, it's, it's, it's fantastically exciting. And uh, just thinking about that, do you have any best guesses as to what like the future for Forest School might look like from, from the people that you've spoken to and the research that you've done? Obviously, a lot of it depends on what happens with our political masters as to the status of Forest School nationally and what happens with climate change as to how much impacts on how we can get how we can go into woodlands um i would like to see the nature premium which seems to be gaining traction um moving into a more mainstream setting i think yeah my own phd is only one of several now in the field and the more people that we get talking about um, forest school with passion but with academic rigor, the harder, the, 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 the more certain its status is in, in the field. Um, and it's growing up and it's strengthening. Um, and people are gaining in confidence. They are gaining in confidence to say, this is what we need. I need to run my sessions every week for a year because there's all this data that says that's what we have to do. Um, so the confidence is coming, the data is coming, the status and recognition is coming. Um, it behoves us to make sure that the Forest School Association stays strong so that we can be the national voice. Um, I think we're doing quite well on that. We can do better, we can always do better. <laughs> uh, we need to find a way to be, to include more diversity in our trainer and, and uh, activist um, for, uh, population. There aren't enough people from different communities, um, which is daft because we deliver it to children from a whole range of communities. But we're not actually getting the trainers in enough. Um, so there's work to do there. Um, but as we gain in confidence and can stand up and be counted, we also have the confidence to recognize our position, as I say, as one tree in a forest, and to accept that we're not the only solution to some problems. There are other things out there that are important. And when you look at the way that it's that forest school type um, kindergarten is delivered across the Scandinavian countries and across northern Germany, what's it in the northern countries? Everybody worries about weather, but it really, I mean, it's most popular in the countries that have the weather that might be deemed inclement um but it, it, that's where it is and what happens is that children get forest school type experiences as almost not all of them but most because it's not always in the cities and it's not always accessible to all communities but most of them have access to this kind of education which lays those strong social and emotional foundations for and cultural foundations to a love of the outside to a strength in themselves to strong dispositions to learning and then it's not so necessary later on now we're seeing it's being effective as a remediation whether that's with adults teenagers um, children who've been damaged by society in some way or another um, or who don't fit into a mainstream setting in some way or another. And, and yes, in our context, that is really, really important. But wouldn't it be lovely if it wasn't necessary? 
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. We could do it properly in the early years. We wouldn't need it anywhere else. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. But I often start my training courses by saying the fact that I have a job training you to be a forest school leader is a symptom of how sick our society has has got. Yeah. That you know, children are not having these sorts of natural play experiences it you know in nature in the first place yes um, and it's not part of their training as early as teachers uh, yeah absolutely yeah Which it should be yeah yeah when i went out uh, i went to the university of umel um and went on an outdoor trip with them with their pe students students training in pe to strain to be a pe teacher in sweden you have to be able to do, dig a snow hole. You have to be able to forecast the weather. <laughs> All of these things are a normal part. You have to be able to use three different sets of skis and the snowboard. All of this is part of a normal teacher training program for PE teachers, not environmental scientists, PE teachers, you know. So having experienced that in, in other countries, what have you have you noticed any reasons why that is you know is there something about their culture or about their political landscape that you think is why they are being uh, i guess more prepared to be outdoors some of it's to do with population my niece lives in finland population of the whole of finland is about the same as greater london and the whole of the UK would fit into Finland three times. It's an awful lot more space than there is people. Um, it's just so, you know, it's easy, natural and normal to be outside. It's what you do. They all live in flats, but these flats look out onto woods. So my niece, you know, they've got this big balcony all the flats have balconies, big balcony where they grow their tomatoes and the cat sits. Um, and I looked out, I was over there a couple of weeks ago, looking out on birch trees. When we walked to the supermarket, their main supermarket, we walked through the trees. So there is a big cultural difference. There's a big geographical distance, difference. Um, and those two things together, I mean, it, it was um, Heinrich Gibson in 1859 who coined the term Friluftsleben, uh, fresh air life, to describe the way in which that is culturally embedded in Scandinavian way of life. Everybody goes outside. And that's, that's quite different to the UK. Um, so when you import an idea from another culture, you have to think about why do I think it's a good idea? How will it fit? Why will it fit? Uh, what, what tweaks are we going to need to do? And the business of us having to do training is one of those tweaks. It's not culturally embedded, so we have to deliver it as something as an extra. Um, it may, that may change over time or it may not. We may always have it as an add-on. But as long as all children have it as an add-on, that's okay. Because you can have a community of forest school leaders in a conurbation that are delivering forest school sessions to a number of settings. If it's just the early years settings, as a model, that would work. But it's quite interesting seeing how the Far East have cottoned onto this i mean it's, it's very strong a form of forest school not necessarily what we call forest school but a form of forest school is very strong in japan in south korea and in, Ch in areas of china um and there they see it as an antidote to an even more rigid education system than ours um, and they see it as a really important intervention for, for mental health. For young children, which is scary, that they yeah. should need that. But they need it and they're taking it. They're making it their own. It's not what we would call forest school, but mm. it's there. 
I suppose that coming back to that idea of things evolving, if you are in different cultural settings, then it is going to naturally evolve to fit that culture. Yeah. Um, and so I guess to fit the needs that are coming up in that culture as well. So if we ever get to the point of having an international forest school conference, what we mustn't do is have turf wars about what forest school is and is not. We've got to be able to say, this is forest school in the UK. And that's right for us. And what you do is going to be right for you. And let's just have a debate about which of the six principles works for you and which doesn't and what you're going to do about it and what the outcomes are going to be as a result. Rather than, as I say, turf wars, which I don't think are very healthy. <laughs> oh. It just it's interesting to hear there about the different a different kind of uh, countries that are adopting it. And I just wonder if there are from your observations, are, are there any common threads or patterns? I know they're not going to be identical, but are there key strands that have been woven through all of them that you've observed? What do you mean in terms of the way they deliver? Yes, in all the different countries. Yes, I mean, I would think that the holistic learning, particularly when you're talking early years, that is very much embedded. Um, the idea of seeking out wooded spaces, which can be a challenge in the middle of Beijing, um, particularly with the pollution that they've got. They, they're, they're really wrestling with that one, but they are wrestling with it. They are determined to do it. Um, the fact that you are creating relationships um, between the, the children and the, and the staff and the children and each other, that building communities aspect. I think what everybody struggles with is leaving it long enough, keeping going long enough. You and I both know that when you get to the end of six weeks, you are only just beginning to see an improvement, a change, some, something coming forth. You haven't had time to consolidate it. You haven't had time to set it into the brains as, 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 as plasticity of the neural pathways and things. So it's still soft enough there to be undone, the good to be undone. And we don't want that happening. That's, that's a real problem. Risk taking. Um, they would say they are taking risks but perceptions of risk are very, very different. So the Canadian forest school people's risk involves taking a bear klaxon out with them so that if a bear comes, you know what to do. <laughs> the perception of taking risk in China is very, because they wrap their children in cotton wool, is very much about, oh, um, possibly we might let them use um a potato peeler after about 10 weeks you know never going to get as far as knives never in a million years um so those kinds of things that they, they are very culturally contextualized um yeah so they try <laughs> and i guess just kind of Going back a little bit in our conversation about you, you saying that the research where, where you saw that the schools doing the full fat version of Forest School with mm. those six principles did have significant difference in the in the outcomes. I guess I'm just trying to connect the two to what to wonder whether that across the board, across the world, whether the, the, there's a enough of those six principles in what everybody's doing to see significant benefits. Well, as you said, any benefits benefit. Yeah. Um, and you cannot help but hope that nationally they will go on the same journey that some of us went on as individuals. I know when I started, I wasn't brave enough to take the risks with groups that I would now, you know, when I was just starting out. And I suspect that applies to most of us. You have to be brave enough, you have to be experienced enough to be able to move into the area where you think, no, that's fine, it doesn't matter. And we're, we're, we're brave in different things. I mean, as a child, I had always climbed trees. 
So the idea of children climbing trees was never a struggle. Um, as far as I was concerned, that's what children do. When it came to using sharp tools, it took me longer because that wasn't something I was familiar with. So I hope that culturally, the whole country of Japan, China, Korea, whatever it is, will go on that journey and they will incrementally start to take more risks and see that actually that is beneficial that it has a greater output, that those children are therefore more competent about and confident about managing their own risks because they've done X, Y, or Z. So, but it, it'll take longer. Yeah, that's a really good point that we're, we're all on our own journey. And I guess, yeah, nationally as a country, the country itself is on its own journey, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, which is part of the fun, isn't it? You know, part of, uh, part of the fun is learning and growing and developing as individuals and as communities uh taking the path less traveled <laughs> really and you know sometimes there's going to be things in the way of the pathway isn't it it's, mm. it's going to be a fallen tree or something yeah. to, to try to navigate around or climb mm. over or battle against um mm. and i guess what i've noticed with forest school is that people who have experienced it and actually seen the transformative power that can come from it and the difference it can make for individuals lives they feel so passionate about it that they will go and fight for it or you know it doesn't matter how thorny the path is they'll still try to 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 navigate it and to uh to promote it and to to get it so that the children will experience it yeah yeah that's right. Yeah. Thinking about, you know, in the short term, we're, we're due for an economic crash. We, you know, I know that the children who are at risk, the children whose outcomes are threatened, are going to need forest school more than ever. Um, that's going to be a big tree in our pathway. Um, and it's going to need passionate people to go out and seek the funding to be able to provide those children free of charge the things that they're going to need to survive. Um, so Thank that'll you. be a challenge, yeah. And again, just coming back again to that, that the research about the difference between the schools doing full fat, um, six principal yeah. forest school and the others, and we're talking about barriers at the moment what did you did you notice in the schools that weren't able to provide the full experience did you notice wh whether there were any common barriers or common challenges as to what was preventing them doing it's, all six it's senior management usually it's whether your senior management team have bought into forest school fully or not um now that might be lack of their own experience or it might be financial drivers um in my experience it's much much more likely to be that they haven't had that experience themselves um and are i can't see the value of it to the extent that we can they'll buy into it oh yes yeah, it's, it's good for the early years yes <laughs> the early years usually get sidelined doesn't it? <laughs> there aren't very many head teachers who you go into their office as i did with one lovely lady walked into her office and there was a big sign on the wall that said tall buildings are built on strong foundations all her spare money went into the foundation stage. But, you know, that's rare, sadly rare, particularly where you've got big academies where most of the senior management team actually come from sec a secondary background. Um, and they just, they've never, the whole idea of holistic education is a complete mystery to them as to why that's important how children learn. Um, I don't think I've probably half of them have even heard of Piaget or Vygotsky or anybody like that. Um, certainly not Pestalozzi or Rousseau. <laughs> we are into totally alien clients there.
so yeah I think that's that's a big block it and it does mean that the forest school leader the one who is committed has got to find ways to get them out to get them experiencing it to evidence the change um, themselves and I'm hopeful that when we get the forest school app up and running as we're hoping to in the autumn that it will help individual forest school leaders or teachers who want to, do, to ha have it in their settings to create their own case studies and say now look here's the hard data um, that would be good mm. just as well like you're, you're talking there about how the early years gets undervalued in in the uk like that's something that i've noticed as well because when, when i was teaching i taught reception and and key stage one but um and yeah, there, there does seem to be a slight undercurrent in our education system about, yeah. you know, when you've got hierarchy, when you've got it driven by politics. And in, I love the fact in Finland, they've taken the, um, the whole education system away from the politicians on the basis that they don't know anything about it. That's just terrific. Um, when you've got politicians making decisions about curriculum about which they know be from a bull's foot and the majority of the politicians have come from a private school background where traditionally children didn't actually start school until they were seven and they were educated at home until they were seven the whole background the education system is skewed against the early years and that is the most important time as we know that is when your predispositions to learning are set and it's it's so much harder to change at a later age than it is if they're under seven that's where we should be putting all of our focus all of our effort all of our energy if children come to school at the at a later age but with strong social and emotional foundations they fly when i had my own nursery class i was constantly under pressure from parents to teach children to read and I, and I refused and i'd have the parents in to watch what i was doing um i said no i want them so passionate about learning to read when they leave me that they will fly in the reception class and they used to because they'd be so geared up to wanting this thing i've been reading to them i've been showing them the pictures i've been showing them the text doing all this pre-reading stuff so that by the time they got to actually having to put the effort in to learn these letters and these words and things they were so passionate about it wanting it and needing it that they'd go for it and that's what you want you want children passionate and strong enough to fight confident enough to fight for what they want and what they need and with that that resilience that which they really really need um yeah that's it's that's what we can give them for a school we can give them resilience and confidence and all of the things that they're going to need to fly when they hit school and that sense of self as well that that awareness of this is me they this are, is who I am. yeah <laughs> what they like what they enjoy doing through you know through their play experiences and able to articulate it you know in their own little ways i think they're wonderful three to four year olds i adore working with them they are such fun they're so rewarding their perspective on the world is just it's 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 invigorating to be with them yeah their, their perception of the world is often i think more accurate than sort of older people yeah yes it hasn't got that film of of, of um expectation or cultural norms in there yet you know yeah, yeah. Mm. absolutely and i guess it's interesting they're just coming back to the reflections about how perhaps the the adults in those children's lives may not have had outdoor natural play experiences themselves mm. and, and like you say so 
I, I always see it as the, it's not the children that need forest school. Like the children would be fine, if, you know, yeah. if you're just like, here's some woods, off you go, kid. They'll be fine. It's not the children that need the forest school. It's, it's actually the adults that, that haven't had it and therefore are, I guess, becoming a bit of a barrier to the children experiencing it. Yeah, because they are fearful. And obviously they, they want the best for their children and they want to care and nurture their children. But their perception of what that care and nurture is, has been skewed by an indoor perspective. Um, and a consumeristic so yes. version. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, sessions for the parents, go for it. I <laughs> think it's great. It's where Elizabeth uh, Swift and Carol Middleton, how I first met them, was when they were working with the early years team in Essex running sessions with parents where the families were at risk, taking the parents out into the woods. Um, it was lovely to see um, and helping the parents to understand what outdoor play was and why it was important. How did you, how did, from, from observing sessions with, with parents then, how uh, did you notice how they were responding to that? Oh, it's hysterical. The dads go for the fire and the marshmallows, <laughs> and the tools, and the mums sit around and want to to bash the 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 the, the print the, the leaf prints and all of that kind of stuff and natter and it's 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 so stereotypical when you get them out there you are just so funny but yes and they they love it in fact I've seen parents I heard parents say. I wanted to do this because I wanted to know what I was missing out on. <laughs> they were just dying to get out there because of what, what their kids were enjoying. But yeah, I think forest, I mean, I, I volunteer now uh, one day a week at a coppice in, in the mid center of town uh, where basically the philosophy is around mental health and well-being for adults. Um, uh, and there's an awful lot of chatting over coffee, but there's quite a lot of <laughs> silver culture as well. And it's it's so good. It's so nice. Um, I think adults need it. Yeah. Mel is running um, an elders tribe now once a month, her elders. And they're, they're in their 70s, 80s and 90s, some of them. And they come in and they do the forest school activities just the same the kids do. And it's great. And a lot of them bring such a wealth of experience and knowledge. It's lovely. I mean, I guess it's, with, it's, with, it's something primal, isn't it, within us? Oh, We've yes. all come from nature. We all are nature. Our ancestors would have sat around fires in the woods in community. Yeah. And I guess we, you know, our, our brains and bodies haven't evolved any different to our hunter-gatherer ancestors have they and so at a really deep core of our, our essence you know that's something that just is natural to to everyone regardless of how cut off our lives might be for from nature I guess we remember once we're back in it. Carl Jung recognized that he said you know we need trees other people have said we need trees Lots of people have said, we need fires. We need that experience of sharing around the fire, the stories and songs and tales of our ancestors. Oh, you're too young. Did you just ever watch Nog in the Nog? Um, the intro introduction was, I'll tell you a tale that the North men told as they sat around their old log fires. And just that expression, it's just gorgeous words. Yeah, Oliver Postgate at his finest. Yeah, mm. but we do. We need to sit around the log fires and tell stories. Yeah, and uh, I think I I wonder whether I mean forest school. We talked as being one tree in the forest of of other approaches. We are starting, I think, to see recognition of the importance of nature for people's mental health and physical health mm. and these other trees might be popping up in the forest under different names yes. uh, you know like ecotherapies or forest bathing and uh, these other sort of interventions but they again have shared mycelium uh, with perhaps forest school with some of those elements of that connecting with nature yes. long-term processes within nature yeah. um, I think so so. I, very much so 
mm. for me I see forest school I like that like coming to forest school from already doing environmental education the thing that kind of got me hooked immediately on that fateful day uh, <laughs> down, down in Suffolk yeah um was that the depth of the connection that that can come from a long-term process within nature with the same group at the same site and all that kind of that connective processes that mm -hmm. can really then make a difference in people's lives yeah yeah powerful very powerful i wondered if you had any significant uh experiences in nature like any particular nature connective experiences little story to share from your own life when i was i suppose about 11 12 um family was going through a difficult time um my grandfather had an orchard very old orchard and there was one tree apple tree and it had a branch that went up and then it went along quite a long way quite a long straight branch and i can still now recall lying on that branch and the texture of the bark and the feel of the sun patterning through the leaves and the breeze from that experience and just how healing it was for the time that you know, I was away, I could get away from everybody and everything, go up my tree, lie on that branch and let it heal me. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story and thank you for sharing all your wisdom and experiences <laughs> of, uh, of, of forest school so, so far. In <laughs> so far, <laughs> yes. <laughs> UK and beyond and exciting to see what the future will bring. Indeed. Yeah. How indeed. the forest will grow and evolve. Yes. <laughs> yes. How wonderful. A lovely thought. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.